It's kind of a longer chapter, but it's a great chapter. Deuteronomy chapter number four. We've been, I've been teaching a lot lately, uh, especially when we start, we just started going through the book of Psalms on Wednesday night, and it's come up in a couple other sermons about, um, you know, meditating on God's law and learning God's law and learning to love God's law and going back to the Old Testament. And there's very good reason for this. Uh, we see here in Deuteronomy chapter four, uh, in verse number 40, the Bible says, Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. It's for our own benefit. It's good to know God's laws. He gives us our, his laws for a good reason and things like that. Now, um, we know that I've taught that before. But what happens oftentimes is when you really start digging into God's law and loving God's law and, and you know, speaking what's in your heart, if God's law is in your heart, what are people going to call you? They're going to call you judgmental, right? Why are you judging? And what I'm going to be preaching about most of this morning is judging righteous judgment. Now, what typically happens with, with people wanting to say, oh, you're so judgmental, it's usually something that affects them. Most people don't have a problem when you're judging things that don't have some type of an impact on them personally. For example, I mean, we think about it, we judge all the time. People judge, you have to judge constantly. We constantly are required to judge and we do it in, on a day-to-day -day basis. Even the people that say judge, oh, you're not supposed to judge, you can't judge anything, they're always judging. And in fact, when they're telling you not to judge, they're judging you by you saying whatever it is that you're saying. Or you, oh, no, you can't judge. They just made a judgment that you're wrong. You always have to decide right and wrong, like, all, at every aspect, pretty much, in your life, during the day, whatever you do. When you make decisions, guess what? A decision is a judgment. You're deciding what you're going to do. You're deciding, and, and, you know, now, most importantly, we want to know what's right and wrong. You can make this, you know, decisions of what you're going to make for, for, for lunch or whatever that have no bearing necessarily or any consequence of any real value. But in judging right from wrong, we need to figure out what's right and what's wrong. And we get that, of course, from God's word. I, do tur I, do, I mentioned before we start reading to, to turn to Proverbs 21. Excuse me. Proverbs chapter 21. Keep your place here in Deuteronomy 4. We're coming right back to it. But if you want to look at uh, Proverbs 21, verse number 2, the Bible says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes but the Lord pondereth the hearts. So every way, you know, every time, you know, people generally think that what they do is right all the time. I mean, that's how people are. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. The Bible says, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. God knows what's in your heart. God knows the truth. And then in verse three, it says to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. See, people think they're going to make God real happy and, and pleased with them when they, when they put forth, oh man, I made this great sacrifice of my time, of my money, or whatever. And the Bible's saying, you know what? Just to do justice and judgment is more acceptable. I want you doing what's right. And notice it says judgment. So doing judgment is more acceptable to God than offering up sacrifices. That's what he wants to see more. He actually wants to see good judgment from us. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time in, in proving that, yeah, we should judge. It's pretty obvious that, that everybody judges, but God wants us to have a righteous judgment. So, you know, when people, everybody judges, whether they want to admit it or not, turn back if you would to Deuteronomy chapter four, but who decides what's right and wrong, right? The way of every man is right in his own eyes. Where do we get judgment from? Who decides what's just? Of course, the answer is God. God determines what's right and wrong. Otherwise, you know, how do you determine what's right, what's wrong? How do you have any, any sense of morality? You know, it's, it's fun having conversations with atheists about this because they have no absolute. There, there is no fundamental just, just going back to uh, a, a truth because everything is going to end up being subjective because whatever they say is, oh, well, if you hurt other people, that's bad. Well, who are you to say that? Right? If we're on the same level playing field and say, well, what if, what if it helps me to hurt somebody else? Why should I care? What would make that wrong? Well, you shouldn't do that. Well, why? Why shouldn't you do it? Because it's not nice. Well, so what? I, you know, if, it's, if it's for my benefit, I think it's great. So when you have that type of a mindset or an attitude, who's for anyone to say anyone else is wrong? 
But see, it's mostly the, the atheistic God-hating community that's going to be railing on the Christian saying, don't judge anyways. Because ultimately, whether they're going to profess it out loud in front of everybody or not, that's the attitude they have, is that it's all about me. If it's good for me, then every way of man is right in my eyes. The things that I do are okay. And they have no solid way to define right and wrong because they don't believe in God or they don't want to believe in God. They don't like the God of the Bible. They don't like the rules of what is right and wrong. So they just want to say, no, that's not right, but I'm going to come up with my own. And without, without God, without a creator, there is, there is no one's better than the other. Now that doesn't prove that God's real, but that's just the fact of, of what they believe. Um, turn if you to Deuteronomy chapter 4, where we should be, where we read verse number 1, because the Bible tells us all that we should and should not be doing. God even outlines how his system of government is to be run on this earth. He, has, he gives us all the answers. And a system of, of government, the government that God designed to have, and I'm not going to get too much into this, but you can read Romans 13, and you can read other, many other passages in the Bible, is that God establishes powers, and the purpose of a government is in order to punish evildoers. So when people do break laws, when they do go too far, when they do harm other people, when they do steal and commit murder and commit other crimes against other people, that God has said, this is wrong, you can't do this. The, the job and the role of the government is supposed to punish those people because there has to be consequences for their actions. It, it all makes perfect sense. It's not... It's not anything very earth-shattering that I'm covering right now this morning about this. But look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. The statutes, which is laws and judgments, right? These are God's judgments on what's right and what's wrong. Verse number 2. He shall not add unto the word which I command you. Neither shall ye diminish aught from it, but that, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. And basically he's just proving the point. He says, look, don't, don't take away from my words. Don't add to it. My law is the law. It's the way it is. What I said is right. You don't have to change it. Don't alter it at all. And if you love my law, if you listen to me, you're going to live. Things are going to go well for you. And if you despise my law, if you don't do what's right, it's not going to go well for you. And he brings up this example of Baal Peor. He says, look at everyone that claimed the Baal Peor and they went off into fornication and married strange wives and things like that. He says, look what happened to them. I destroyed them all. But those of you that kept my word, you're alive today. You didn't go off in that path. You went and took the right path and didn't do that which was wrong. Verse number five. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whether you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely... This great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Now this statement is, is showing and making clear that if they were to follow God's laws and institute God's commandments and set up things to be run under God's orders with God as the king, with God as the lawgiver, and they institute these things, he says, you would, be, I mean, this, that would be so wise and show how much understanding you have to trust God, that God's judgments and true, that all the other nations around would say, wow, what nation is like this nation? And see, people want to go to, and look, I understand, you know, we're not living under those conditions today. We don't have a government that has 
claimed God's law and claimed God to be king and is, and is being run under that as the nation of Israel started off to be, as God had intended. But even Israel changed later on when they wanted a king. And, he, and God said to, uh, to Samuel, fine, you know, they haven't rejected you because Samuel was a judge at that time. God ordained there to be judges that would rule and, and basically determine right from wrong according to God's word, according to God's judgments. They would be the ones when a case would come up and people have a conflict that would judge and say, well, here's what God's word says. And they would make that proclamation. They would be the final authority because they're going back to God's authority and God's ultimate judgment. That's the way that God designed human government to be run, using God's commandments, God's laws. Amen. Yet today, even Christians want to just kind of, well, you know, that was for a different time, that was for a different people, you know, things aren't like that. Yeah, they're not like that now, but what, they, what they're doing is they're trying to throw away a lot of the judgments that God has pronounced because they're not popular today. They, want, they seem to think that they can be judges over God's law in determining right from wrong apart from just accepting what the Bible says. And let me explain it this way. What I'm talking about is that there are what today's society would deem to be very severe punishments for different crimes according to the Bible. For example, if someone were to get caught kidnapping someone else, the Bible says that is a death penalty. That is a capital crime. If someone is caught kidnapping somebody else, you put the person to death. If a person is caught committing adultery, cheating on their spouse, if they go off and they commit adultery, the Bible says you put the adulterer and the adulteress to death. They lose their life. If there is a man found lying with mankind as he lieth with a woman, they both shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's what the Bible says. And there are many other instances where people are, receive, are supposed to receive, according to God's righteous judgment, the death penalty. And look, I preach an entire sermon on the death penalty. You go back and look it up where I covered all these different things that people could commit and I'm not going to cover them all today. But the point being that God is the one that determines right from wrong. Yet today people want to say, oh, well, yeah, no, we shouldn't do that because we're not living under Israel. Well, what, does that mean that God's judgment, that God's decision on how a crime ought to be handled just isn't right anymore? That that was only for those people. Where does the Bible say it's only for those people? Because even in the New Testament, it says that, they, that they're worthy of death. You can read Romans chapter 1. You can read 2 Peter chapter 2. You can read the book of Jude. You can see that, no, all of those things are examples. All of those truths still stand. And, but the problem is, is that people want to just say, oh, well, you're so judgmental. No, you just don't listen to God. You don't have faith in his word. Because, and ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, when we make a judgment and say, you know what, sodomy is such a bad sin that, it deserve, that people deserve to be put to death over it. Oh, you're so judgmental. It's God's judgment. I didn't come up with that on my own. If I were to come up with something on my own, I probably wouldn't say that it deserves a death penalty. Just in my own reasoning, just void of God's counsel and wisdom and understanding, I would probably come up with something different on my own. And, you know, in many cases, I probably would in almost every situation. But see, we have a different perspective, too, because we know that we're sinners. And you know that however you judge, you know, it's going to come back to you. So, you know, the tendency might be, well, let's take it easy on everybody, right? Because I know that I'm not perfect, you know, so let's just take it easy on everybody. But that's not right. Now, there, the way that you judge, I'm going to get into this a little bit more when we turn to Matthew 7, places like that. We do want to be careful in our judgment that it is righteous. And that's the whole point of my sermon this morning is righteous judgment. Okay? But you don't get more righteous than just what God's word says. It says what it says. And we need to embrace God's word and just say, this is what is right. Now, look, I know, and, and I'm not advocating, and I never have, that anybody go and just be the, uh, the power that executes 
judgment upon sinners or upon people who break the law. What we see is God's establishment of what the rule of law should be. And one of the reasons why it's important to even go over this stuff is for there's a few reasons, but one is because we live in a society where our laws can change. There is some type of an input and, and we can have some type of an influence on let's try, you know, if there's ever going to be a change in the law, let's elect people or let's have people that are going to stick to God's law and institute these punishments because it can change. It's probably, I mean, it's probably not going to, but, it, but still we need to be aware of that and just know what's right and what's wrong. So if someone comes along and tries to, to tell you, you know, a different judgment, what should be right and wrong, it's, uh, you know, we could return with the Bible. I, I was just recently watching or listening to, I don't know, I watch, when, sometimes when I work, I listen to some documentaries and some other things, and I, I realized how, how, and it didn't take this for me to realize how corrupt our justice system is, but one of the things that they do when they're trying to find murderers and killers and stuff like that is they offer people, you know, these plea agreements, and they'll say, oh, well, well, you'll get only this punishment if you give us information. And if, you know, they, they start de making deals with them. But God's word says that you're not to take any satisfaction, like from a murderer, that you're not supposed to take and make any deals with them, that the punishment is supposed to be the death penalty no matter what. That in order for God's judgment to be executed properly, you don't make deals with them. You don't, you don't, you don't talk to them and say, well, who, who else can you turn in or what more information can you provide? If they're found to be a murderer, they're going to be put to death and there should be nothing taken in exchange for that because otherwise justice isn't being served. And people don't like to hear that and people make excuses. Say, oh, well, it's better for us to be able to find this and do that. And, you know, it's like, you're using your own wisdom and superseding God's wisdom and God's justice and, and uh, his sense of judgment. Well, let's not judge God's law as being faulty. We should accept and embrace God's law and recognize what it truly is. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 26. Besides the fact that, that our laws can change, another reason for understanding God's judgment on particular crimes and sins is for us to get a proper view of those sins and have, yes, a proper hatred for those sins. That we should abhor the evil and cleave to that which is good and understanding how bad certain things are will help us in our judgment so that we could, we could not get this soft spot for sins, especially sins that, that God considers to be capital offenses, offenses where someone would lose their life over, that we don't, we don't want to get soft on that. Let's stay with the right judge, uh, judgment and justice according to God's word. Leviticus chapter 26, we're going to start reading there in verse number 14, because today people despise God's law. They hear these things. About, you know, and the big thing today is just, you know, putting homos to death, right? That's, that's the number one thing. And you know what? Oftentimes what the mockers and the God haters will respond with, well, what about the disobedient child? Which the Bible doesn't say disobedient child, but if, if, a, if a child, it says smites their father or mother, and you can look in the context, it's not talking about a five-year-old, okay? It's talking about someone who's grown, you know, because in the same context, it also refers to them being a glutton and a drunkard and all this other stuff, right? And if they have no respect for their parents that raised them and they go and they hit their father or their mother, they ought to be put to death. And you know what? That's what God's word says. And I won't back down from that and say, oh, try to make something. Oh, well, that was for a different time or you need to understand the culture. No, that's timeless. Okay, this is God's word and his judgment. And that is wicked as hell. And a person that does, a child that does that deserves to be put to death. But see, they'll throw these things out there to try to point out hypocrisy because there are a lot of hip, 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 hypocritical Christians out there that will just pick and choose certain things and they're judging unrighteously. But we need to judge righteously. And, and we should not have hypocrisy and picking out certain sins that we feel are worse than others when God's word says, hey, no, adultery, 
you know, uh, uh, kidnapping, a child hit, smiting their parents. They all deserve the death penalty. And they do. And that's a righteous judgment then and, and lacking hypocrisy when we could just say, this is what the Bible says, this is what God's word says, and I'm going to trust in God's judgment and not in what man thinks. But people don't want to hear that. They hate God's law. And look at God's judgment about people who hate his law. Leviticus 26, verse number 14, the Bible reads, But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I mean, it, it, it's bad enough just to this point, just a couple of verses talking about God setting his face against you, terror, consumption, sorrow of heart, right? Uh, when you sow, your seed's going to be sown in vain. Your enemies are going to rule over you. These are all pretty ba significantly bad things. And then he says, and if that's still not enough, if you still don't want to listen to me, it's going to be seven times worse than that. Verse 19, and I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield or increase Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And you can keep reading on in this chapter. I'm not going to keep going. It goes on and on and on and seven times more and seven times more. And he goes and lists off more and more and more of the cursings that are going to come when a people rejects God's judgment and God's justice and God's laws and says, we don't like this. I hate that. I can't believe you're saying that. I can't believe you would even suggest that we should put a homo to death. I can't believe you'd say that. And people hate that. Well, guess what they're going to bring on themselves? When people hate God's judgment, it's written here in Leviticus 26. And we need to be mindful of this. We need to be the salt of the earth. We need to be willing to say the things that are not popular and stand up for God's righteousness and God's judgment, not our own judgment, not our own righteousness, but the righteousness that comes from God's word and his laws and say, this is what is right. This is the way things should be dealt with. And the people that want to, you know, make excuses for God's law, the Christians that want to make excuses for God's law, how do you think Jesus is going to rule when he comes back to this earth? I mean, really? Really? These laws were what God had intended back then. You think he's not going to come up with a whole different set of laws than what God has already said? These are righteous laws and judgments and, and that if you institute these, everyone's going to say how wise and understanding you are and how close God is to you because you're using these laws. We, we went over this last week, but you know there is going to be a kingdom set up for a thousand years on this earth with Jesus Christ being the king and he will be ruling and reigning. Do you think it's just going to be a free-for-all? Because look, there's going to be, yes, there's going to be people who are already saved and their glorified bodies. They're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. But there's also going to be a bunch of people who are unbelievers on the earth at that time, during those thousand years. It's not just believers. There is going to be plenty of unbelievers. And uh, Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. That's the branch. It's talking about Jesus Christ, the king. He is going to execute judgment and justice in the earth. And we saw this last week as well, but in Revelation 19, we're going to see at the, the be basically the beginning of his kingdom, when he's setting up his kingdom, when he comes on the white horse at the end of the pouring out of God's wrath 
in Revelation 19, verse 11, the Bible says that I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make, yes, Jesus Christ judges. Amen. I know, and, and you know what? If you want to be a Christian, you're going to follow Jesus, right? Jesus judged. Well, let, we could judge too. We're going to judge righteously though. You see, Jesus, every judgment Jesus makes is righteous. Let's be a righteous judge like Jesus, let's, let's judge things righteously. Verse number 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them, listen to this, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Jesus isn't some softy, some pushover. When he comes up and sets up his seat, now, the first time he came, and this is where people get confused. The first time he came, he did not come to be the judge. He did not come to be the king. He did not come to set up his kingdom on earth. He came to be the savior of the world. He came as a servant. He came in humility. He came to offer up himself as a sacrifice. He came in love to give everybody the opportunity to be saved. That's the, the, the whole sole purpose of him coming the first time. But he's already done that. He came to be the lamb, to be sacrificed, to be the atonement for our sins. And he totally came in love. Now, it doesn't mean he was a pushover then either, but he wasn't filling the role of a judge. And uh, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Because it's important to understand this concept of Jesus not coming to judge the earth, but coming to save the world. There's a difference in his role, but people will, will take this passage in, um, well, it's in John chapter 8, we're going to get to that in a minute. People will, will, will take passages and say, oh, well, look at this that happened, you know, we're going to get to the woman taken in adultery. So Jesus is changing the law, right? No, he didn't come to judge. He didn't come to judge people and put them to death the first time he came. It's not why he was coming. He was coming to bring salvation. But people ought to turn to those verses and say, oh, look at this, see? That means that adulterers should no longer be put to death. We're going to get to that. First, I want to see what Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew chapter 5. Because when he comes a second time, he is going to come and be a king and be a judge, and he, and he will be ordering the execution of people that disobey his laws that are, that are capital crimes. Yes, he will. Because it'll be a righteous kingdom and judgment happening upon this earth. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 17. The Bible reads, Jesus Christ himself saying, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Listen, I didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. The Old Testament. I didn't come to do away with the Old Testament. That it's just completely null and void. That there's nothing true anymore. That it's all completely different. That everything has changed. No, he came to fulfill now, there are some aspects of the law, and we're not going to get into detail on that this morning, that he did fulfill. Being the lamb, he fulfilled the lamb sacrifice that was required every year for the people to do. There's other, other sacrifices that he fulfilled. He's the rest of the Sabbath day that in him we don't have to work. So, so he fulfilled that as well. There are certain things that he fulfilled, but he didn't fulfill all of the law when he came the first time. Verse number 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. All has not been fulfilled yet. So the law hasn't been completely done away. Verse number 19, Whosoever therefore shall break, look at this, this is important. Whosoever there shall, therefore shall break one of these least commandments, so about the commandments of the Lord. One of the least commandments, one of the smallest things that you say, is that really a big deal? Well, if it's one of God's commandments, you just break one of the least ones and shall teach men so. And you tell other people, oh yeah, this isn't a big deal. We don't have to do this. We don't have to follow this. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So this is talking about a believer. 
who is just saying, no, we don't need to follow the laws, and you're teaching other people, no, no, we don't need to follow the laws, we don't need to follow that, he's going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. But those that do and teach them, what? Teaching God's law, teaching righteousness through God's law, yeah, is, may seem judgmental because they're saying this is right and this is wicked. They're judging between right and wrong. According to God's law, they're going to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now pay attention to this because he's going to bring up some things and some Old Testament commandments and laws and stuff. And we're going to see where Jesus lands on the scale of is he doing away with the Old Testament law or not? Because he says, hey, you heard it, you've heard it said that you shouldn't kill. And if, you're, if you kill, you're in danger of the judgment. Look what Jesus says, verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rachel shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Does it sound like he's softening up the crimes and the, and the punishments at all? Or is he making them a little bit more strict? Because he says, hey, you heard it said not to kill, but I'm telling you, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger. Being angry with someone and killing someone are obviously two different things. And he's, and he's ramping it up and making the, the standard even more tight than it was in the Old Testament. Look, jump down to verse number 27. 27, he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? And adultery was another one. We, he, he mentioned murder, capital offense. Adultery, capital offense, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He's saying, when you're lusting after someone, you're committing adultery in your heart. And he's condemning it. Don't do it, Right? Verse number 31, we see another reference here. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. He's laying out the law and explaining, no, look, you need to really pay attention to the law and apply it in every situation, every aspect. And, and give the full meaning where he's not lessening it, he's not weakening the law, he's strengthening it by applying the law to many other things, right? Like, so like applying it to what's in your heart and applying it righteously to other situations. That's what Jesus did. This is what Jesus said. So turn if you go to John chapter 8. Just keeping this in mind that this was the attitude that Jesus had about the law. He wasn't doing away with it. He didn't come to destroy the law. He wasn't saying, oh, well, yeah, you still shouldn't kill, but we're going to change the punishment for it. He never once said any of that. Now, people interpret things like this because of the story in John chapter 8. And this is always the passage that the people who never read their Bibles always want to turn to because this is like the only thing they ever remember or have ever heard because it's their, it's their go-to to tell people, oh, this is why you can't judge. This is why you can't say things that I don't like. This is why you can't say this is a sin or this is wrong because of John chapter 8, because of the story of the woman taken in adultery, which they don't even know anyways. I've had so many people refer to this story as being the woman at the well because they don't know. Like, no, this isn't the woman at the well. This is the woman taken in adultery. The woman at the well got saved. Okay, this is just a woman taking an adultery that the, the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus into slipping up and to, and to have some, some way they can accuse Jesus of. This is that story. Oh, you didn't know that that's what they were doing? Yeah, it's because you didn't read it. You just heard someone else talk about it and tell you that we shouldn't tell anything, anyone that anything they're doing is wrong because they would be judging. And Jesus said that, you know, whosoever is without sin, let him first cast a, cast a stone. So that means we can't ever make any judgment on anything. That's ridiculous. Let's read, let's read this passage. Though. Let's actually read it and see what the Bible is saying in this passage so that we're not deceived by people who want to just throw this out there 
and teach falsely on it. John chapter 8, look at verse number 4. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. So they caught a woman who, you know, basically what they're saying is that there's no way that, that you can get out of this because, you know, it wasn't just he said, she said, we caught her in the very act. She's committing adultery. They bring her to Jesus, okay? Now, Mo and this is, this is where they're trying to trick him. And it even tells you that. Verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Now, is that true? That's a, yes, it's true. She should be put to death as an adulteress right, according to, to the law of Moses. That is a true statement. But what are they trying to do? Look at what it says. Verse 6, This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. And you can see multiple points in the Bible where they're trying to do this. They're trying to put Jesus in a situation where there is no right answer. They're trying to make it so that no matter what he says, they'll be able to accuse him and get him in trouble and get, you know, and get him executed or whatever because their plan was to kill him. Now, what we could understand when you read the whole Bible, you know that during this time they're under Roman rule. And when the Jews wanted to put Jesus to death, they had to bring him to Herod because they said, well, we don't have the authority, basically, to put him to death. According to our law, he needs to be put to death. So we want you to do the sentencing and judgment against him because they weren't allowed to, to put people to death and to, and to follow their own laws and their own rules. And in so doing, they would be usurping the authority of the government, which would have gotten, you know, so if Jesus would have said, yeah, put her to death. Yep, Moses' law says executor, put her to death. Then he would have been in trouble with the Roman government. They would have had whereof to accuse him. And if he would have said, well, no, then he's obviously breaking the law of Moses. And then he could say, see, he's not a prophet because he doesn't believe in, in God's law. So they were putting him in what they thought was an unwinnable situation. But we also have to remember, too, did Jesus come to judge people, to judge sinners, and to, tell them, and, and to, to send them to hell and, and to execute judgment upon them? Is that why he came? No. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his mission and his objective. He didn't come to fill the position of a, of a ruler or a king. And when they tried to make him king, he got out of there because he didn't want that to happen. That was not God's will. That was not the will that was supposed to be done. So in this story, the whole point of them bringing her to him was to catch him and to trip him up in his words and to accuse him. That's what they were trying to do. So here's how Jesus deals with the situation, how he handles it wisely without getting himself in any trouble and without, without them being able to accuse him of anything. He says, but Jesus stooped down with his finger on the ground. At first, he just ignored him. Just like he didn't even hear him. Just like, whatever. You know, I'm not even going to talk to you. Because he knew. He knew what they're trying to do. Verse number seven. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Did he say, don't kill her? No. Actually, to the contrary, what did he say? Go ahead, throw a stone at her. But he added a caveat. Well, let, let you know, if you're without sin, and obviously, there's a lot of teaching. This is a great story, and there's a lot we can learn from this, but I, it, it makes me angry when people just butcher this story and, and make it into something that he's not teaching. Because he did not say that, well, I know that Moses commanded you to put an adulteress to death, but I'm saying that we don't put him to death. He did not say that at all. He said let him first cast a stone. If, you, if you know, you're without sin, go ahead. Pick up a stone and cast it at her. And again, and let's we'll keep reading. Verse number eight. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So they all left. Because they were convicted. They realized, you know, hey, I'm a sinner, you know, whatever. And, 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 and all the things that, that, um, that they've done. And these people, too, that brought them to, these are wicked people. And, I mean, these were probably murderers already. You know, like, they have, they have no ground to stand on in their judgment. But they all leave. So now it's just Jesus and this woman. Verse number 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? 
So he's like, where is everybody? Because you also remember under Moses' law that there had to be at the mouth of two or three witnesses in order for someone to be put to death. You can't just take like one person's word for it or anything like that. You have to have accusers. You have to have someone that's going to witness and say, now he's at the point, well, is no man coming? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said under her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Well, it got to the point. He can't, I mean, he couldn't even execute the judgment. Now there's no more witnesses. There's no more people bringing up the accusation against her. And that's over. And he tells her, you know what? Because he didn't come to condemn. He came to, to, to save, not to kill and destroy. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And he didn't say just go and keep sinning because it's all okay anyways because there's no judgment. He said go and sin no more. Look, that's what the story says. It's, it's not, you know... <laughs> And the other thing that's funny, too, is people want to apply this story because these are people who literally wanted to, like, pick up stones and kill her. And, uh, and people will use this now at the drop of a hat when you just say, this is wrong, this is a sin. Just recently, there was all that stuff that happened with that, that Greg Locke guy, the pastor, Greg Locke. Um, I, I, he, he gets a lot of likes on Facebook because he's basically like this this conservative Republican guy that, that will say things, you know, he'll, he'll make his strong stands on, on like target allowing, you know, whatever freaks to use whatever bathroom they want and he'll make a big deal about that and it's like, whatever. It's, it, it, it's, it's this raw, raw type of stuff. It doesn't matter, okay? If you don't know him, it really doesn't matter. But the point is when someone else comes out because he just recently got divorced and is saying, well, your pastor, you know, you, you're divorced, you're not ruling your house well, you need to step down because if you're going to have any adherence to God's word, if you're going to listen to what God's word says, and you're going to obey the commandments and the judgments of God's law, then you ought to stand down because that's the right thing to do because the Bible gives the, the qualifications and requirements for a bishop. And now you are in violation of those requirements. So you ought not to be pastor anymore. You're not ruling your house well. And then, that, and then people will hear that and they'll go, oh, if you're without sin and you can't, look, no one's saying to stone the guy to death. We're just saying that you ought not to be pastor. So, you know, people want to just, just take these things and throw it like, oh, because it makes them feel good. It makes them feel righteous that they think that they have God's word to use, even though they're completely butchering it. They don't even know the story. They don't know what it's teaching. That is not judging righteously. That's just trying to defend sin and, and whatever, someone that you like, unrighteously. That's called being a respecter of persons. See, people are defending him because they like him. But you can't defend that position from the Bible. But that's the passage they want to turn to in order to justify it. Turn, if you would, to, uh, turn if you would to John chapter 7. We're going to see, you know, people in the Bible judged but they judged righteously. John the Baptist judged. Mark 6, 17 says, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison. John was arrested and thrown into jail for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. So Herod had a brother named Philip. Philip was married to Herodias. Herod wanted to marry this woman, so they, I assume they got divorced and he ended up marrying her. And John said, that's not right. You can't do that. That's wicked. That goes against scripture. The, you know, the Bible says that, you know, like Jesus said, hey, you put away your wife, uh, you're causing her to commit adultery, and if you marry her that is divorced, you're committing adultery. John was judging righteously, and he judged Herod, who was a judge of, of, the, of the land, you know, he was a judge of his jurisdiction. For John had said unto Herod, it says this in Mark 6, 18, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. <gasps> John the Baptist, you're ju don't you know you're judging? Don't be so judgmental, John. Jesus said, Among them that are born of women, and hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. Apparently Jesus didn't have a problem with John judging. And you know what? John wasn't afraid to judge righteous judgment, even though it landed him in prison. He still had the guts to stand on God's word and not back down against any opposition. John 7, verse number 7. 
Jesus himself judged. I mean, he didn't come to be a judge in the literal sense when he first came, but he still, when he spake, judged. Look at verse number seven of John seven. He says, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. He judged that the works of the world are evil. And that's why the world hated him and why I'm put to death because he says, hey, look, this is wrong. This is wicked. This is evil. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, I'm going to actually leave the rest for tonight. This is kind of a two-parter because I want to just show you, first of all, that judging is, is right when we do it righteously, when it's according to God's word, and don't let anybody back you down on saying what's right and what's wrong. Tonight, I'm going to go over not having a judgmental attitude, okay? Because there's a way that we ought to be judging properly, and we need to be judging righteously. And I'm going to get into that tonight because you don't want to be so caught up in, in knowing and having this knowledge that, hey, if I'm judging righteously, it's okay. Yes, that's true. If you're judging righteously, it's okay. But there is an attitude that we need to have and a proper spirit that we ought to have about us when we make the judgments, when you make the judgment call. And we're going to go over that tonight because there's a holier than thou attitude that people can start to get when they get lifted up with pride and thinking that they know so much of the Bible and they're going to tell everybody what all of their problems are. That's not right either. Okay, and we'll, we'll get into that tonight. I want to I deal with that aspect of it in the evening service. But today, I just want to prove to you that, you know, this whole judge not just ever, you can't judge, you can't say anything bad, you can't say anything is right or wrong because that's judging. That is completely false. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7, because this is the other place that people want, will, will quote, but they don't know where it is and and don't know everything it actually says, we're going to read it and get it in context. Because most people that quote this will only quote the first two words of verse number one. Judge not. Oh, judge not. So you're not supposed to judge. Don't judge. Judge not. But see, the, the, the passage continues. It doesn't just, there's not a period there after those first two words. It says, judge not. It says, judge not that ye be not judged. It's a very important distinction there. Judge not that you be not judged. And let's keep reading, though, so we can actually get a little bit more than just the two, four, six, seven words that are written in that verse to, to get added uh, understanding to what he's talking about when he says, judge not that you be not judged. Verse number two, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. What he's saying is that the same rules that you want to apply to everyone will also apply to you. So be careful in how you judge, because if you're going to judge hypocritically, meaning that you do the same exact things that you're condemning other people for, well, you've just condemned yourself, right? I mean, this is what this is teaching. He's saying, be careful about that. You know, the things that you're guilty of, you're not in a very good point to be condemning anybody else or judging other people that you're guilty of the same exact thing. Now, look, if you're willing to say, which, which I am, I'm willing to say, I know I'm not perfect, but I will stand for righteous judgment in God's word because this is right. And if I fall under something that that's, I'm guilty of, well, I will be guilty of the same thing. It's going to be, it's going to be on God's standard though. And that if I'm going to be punished for not doing things, then it, it's only right. I mean, of course that's right and that's fair. And we need to understand that, that, hey, the way that you judge, it's going to be judged to you. Um, in verse number three, let's keep reading here because the, the, the story goes on, the, the passage goes on. He says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So again, when we keep reading this in context, you get even further understanding. Not only are you going to receive the same judgment that you judge against other people, but now he's saying, look, if you have a much worse problem, 
right? You're talking about a moat. A moat is just a, like a real small piece. Just think of like a speck of dust or something that gets in your eye. How uncomfortable, how painful that can be. You know, you're working with wood or something. Maybe a little, a little wood chip or something like that gets in your eye. And oh man, that's a, that's a problem, right? Hey, that's a problem when you have something. You're like, oh man, I got this thing out. It's causing you a lot of pain, discomfort, everything like that. And then someone comes to you and they've got like an arrow just shooting out of their eye, right? They've got some big old stick just like just jammed through their eyeball. And like, hold on a second, brother. Let me, let me, let me help fix that. Let me, let, me, let me take care of that little speck that you got when I've got this huge gaping problem that's causing me not to see clearly at all, but I'm going to fix all of your little problems. That's what this is saying. Don't judge hypocritically. Look, if you've got serious sin in your life, you have no no place in judging other people that do like the smallest infraction. No place to stand. And that's what he's saying. He said, don't be a hypocrite when you judge. Don't be that guy. <laughs> don't be that guy that everyone knows all these problems that you have in your life and you're going to straighten everybody else out. No. But what does he say? He says, you know what? First, take care of that beam. Take care of your problems and then leave that guy that has problems alone? Does he say that? No. He says, then you could see clearly. Once you clean up your act, get yourself taken care of, you've got your eyes flushed out. Oh, now I can see clearly. Now I can see righteously. Now I'm going to be able to help other people out because that's the goal anyways. It's not, it's not to tear down the guy that's got a moat in his eye. That's not the point. It's to help them. But when you help someone, Sometimes it hurts a little bit even more, right? Like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna go up, let's say brother Matt here has got has got something stuck in his eye, and I'm gonna be like, Matt, I see it. Hold on a second. Don't do it. Don't rub your eye. Don't do anything else. I can help you, but I have to go and actually put my fingers like into his eyeball. Well, you know what? That's probably gonna hurt a little bit more than whatever's stuck in there. But once you get it out, then things get much better right away, right? And when and when you are able to judge righteously and you see someone that has that small flaw that you can help them with because you could see clearly, you're not going to be judging hypocritically, but you could help them. It might sting a little bit for that person to hear the fact that they've got this problem. But if they can accept that humbly, then that problem can help be removed from their life. And you can see where judgment here, and in John 7, 24 is the last place I'm going to quote. Jesus said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's how we're supposed to judge. It's just judging righteously, knowing what's right, knowing God's word, not being a hypocrite, and judging according to God's righteousness. The whole concept of, oh, don't judge ever is false. We can judge. We should judge. We should judge righteously. But let's, let's learn God's words. Let's, learn, let, let's, let's meditate in God's law day and night, as the Bible says. Let's know it. And then we can be the most effective in, in teaching and preaching God's law and in helping people to, to get the sin out of their life so that they're not plagued with the problems that go along with sin. And come back tonight and we're going to go over, you know, good ways of how to do that. Because there are right ways and wrong ways of doing that when you're trying to help people out. So that you're not just this pompous jerk that no one's going to want to listen to and you're not going to be very effective at all because you just come across as this know-it-all that's just super judgmental of everybody. That's not, the way, that's not the way we're supposed to deal with it or handle with it. So let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you give us, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to know right from wrong according to your words, that we can have righteous judgment, dear Lord, that we can make the right decisions, that we can help others out, dear Lord. And um, God, we just ask for you to continue to pour out wisdom and knowledge unto us as we read your words. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.